Um, and so um, I just like to, before I begin, I'd like to thank the, the North Bronx SDA Adventist Men Ministries for inviting me to come and present on this important topic. We're actually gonna talk about a lot of issues today. We're not just gonna talk about black men's health. We're gonna talk about the vaccine. We're gonna talk about open up the church. Um, I might talk about a little bit about what I do at the NIH. And then we're gonna talk about black men's health issues. Um, I think there's a lot of issues um, that we need to discuss. And so we're gonna get into that. So thank you guys for waiting um, and we'll get started. And so just a little bit of background where I, what I've been doing for the last um, year, I've been in um, DC and I actually work at the National Institutes of Health. And this is a picture of their uh, clinical center. And so this is where they have a research hospital where it's dedicated to studying all the diseases that they have really in the world. And they send some of the rarest, most complicated patients. When they can't diagnose somebody, a lot of times they'll send them to the National Institutes of Health. And so National Institutes of Health is kind of like your last line where you can't figure out um, the diagnosis. But the National Institutes of Health is even more than that. They actually guide the research program in the United States. It's, they've uh, spent about $30 billion every year to fund research across the country. And also have their own campus where they do their own intramural research. And so I've been working at the National Institutes of Health to study epidemiology and health disparities. And so epidemiology is kind of like what we see right now in um, the news, right? Like we look at the case counts every day, we're thinking about the vaccine, how much we have to um, vaccinate, the um, herd immunity, as many of us heard, that's a lot of epidemiology concepts. I particularly study um, something else and I'll talk about that a little bit, but people always wonder what is the NIH? And the NIH is people like um, Anthony Fauci. So Anthony Fauci actually heads the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Disease, NIAID. And so he is an NIH, um, employee. He's not even at the top of the NIH. He has a boss named Francis Collins. But um, um, Anthony Fauci is actually the director of the NIAID, and these are lead infectious disease scholar. And so each of um, the disease area has a head um, researcher, and these are the foremost experts in this country on that disease topic. And so Anthony Fauci is the head of the infectious part of the NIH, and he is the lead uh, researcher in this country, and he's a lead doctor for infectious disease. And so what do I do? I particularly um, study eye disease. Um, so people wonder what I'm, what I'm gonna do with medicine. I'm gonna become an eye surgeon. And so you see this picture over here, um, this is what we call a slit light exam. And so um, you see in this picture, you have this woman who's looking straight and they have this little magnifying glass and they're holding it to her eye to look at their retina. A lot of you have heard about retina. If you have a MacBook, you've probably heard of retina display. If you have a cell phone, you've probably heard of retina display. But retina is basically your optic nerve. It's the only visible nerve outside your body that you can see. And so um, hopefully one day I might become a retina specialist and we actually operate on the eye. We also examine the eye. And so we're both physicians and surgeons. So this, in this picture, the person that's using the magnifying glass to look at the retina. And so we also have other tricks, right? And so I'm telling people about this because they wonder like what, you know, what do ophthalmologists do? What do, um, um, you know, these eye doctors do? They're not optometrists, they're ophthalmologists and that's an eye surgeon and eye physician. And so they have different tools. And so this is one of our other tools It's called the indirect ophthalmoscope. These are big words, but basically it's a, it's a, uh, it's a microscope that you put on your eye and you have like glasses and you kind of can look into somebody's retina. You see, they have the microscope, um, the magnifying glass again to look at the retina. And so if you ever take a picture and you see red eyes in the picture, that's actually the retina reflecting light. And so what we like to do is to look at your retina and the retina can tell us a lot about your body. It's a nerve. And so it's actually um, supplied by a lot of blood vessels. So anytime you have hypertension, anytime you have diabetic eye disease, um, so diabetes, one of the complications we'll talk about is eye disease. And so when you have that, a lot of that is manifested in the eye. You can actually see that. And so um, retina specialists help deal with the complications of diabetes. And so if you have diabetes, you're likely seeing a retina specialist, uh, specialist every year. So if, you know, when I become a, when I become a full doctor, I hope that I don't see many of you. And we're going to talk about a lot of the black men's health issues. And so what else do we do? We also use lasers in the clinic. And so a lot of times when people have diabetes, the, uh, the vessels in their eye, eye start to grow a lot. And so we shine a laser into your eye and we basically burn those vessels. And so it's very, it's very small. It looks like, like on the size of a meter, even smaller than that. And we do um, precise burns to your eyes. So that's one of the procedures we do. 
And you also do eye injections. And so this is why you really need to not get diabetes because if you do get diabetes and it gets uncontrolled and you don't do your exercise, we can do um, um, eye injections. And so we inject your eye with a uh, special medicine and you have to come back every month. And this is not comfortable, right? We do um, use anesthesia and we localize it and then we paralyze the eye a little bit, but it's not comfortable to have to sit there and see somebody doing an injection. And then finally, we also do surgery. So we, I said like we are eye surgeons, right? And so if you, if you have an emergency where your retina detaches, so this little, eye, this nerve on the back of your eye, sometimes it can detach and that can cause you to go to blind. A lot of times we'll do emergency surgery. And so this is what we look, this is what it looks like in the operating room. And so you have a microscope here and you're looking through the microscope and then you're operating on the eye. So you see their hands down here, they're operating on the, um, the retina. And so they're gonna operate on the retina. They do a lot of fancy surgeries. They use oil, they use gas. They do a lot of different techniques in the operating room. But this is exactly what we, we do. And so it's a very complicated specialty. Um, it takes six years of training to complete everything um, after medical school, um, but it's very rewarding. And it's um, a very cool um, specialty that you can go into within medicine. And so I'm saying this because I, you know, this is Adventist men. So a lot of the, the Adventist boys and a lot of the young, women and a lot of the young girls, it'll be nice if they can go into medicine. And one thing I didn't know about before medical school was ophthalmology. And I think it's one of the coolest fields of medicine. This is what I wanna do in my career. So when you'll see me in about like five years, this is what I'll be doing. I'll be in the operating room doing these kind of surgeries. So our first topic will be an update on the coronavirus vaccine. So I think we need to talk about the greatest priority that's facing our church. And that's really reopening it and to do it safely. So. Um, I want to talk about that a little bit more. So just to remind everybody, I gave a presentation on um, the, the coronavirus vaccines. Um, you can look up the COVID-19 lecture. If you Google my name, it's on YouTube. You can watch it. I gave that lecture back in December, um, really early on, but there's been a lot of updates. And I want to update a lot of people because people have a lot of questions and I want to give you the current understanding of these vaccines. And so to remind everybody, we have two, um, two mRNA vaccines. We have the Pfizer and the Moderna. Um, and basically they're the same. They use the same technology. They have about the same efficacy. They're basically the same. Pfizer's a little bit different. It's about three weeks um, between doses and then Moderna's about four weeks between doses. And so usually when you go to the clinic, you'll get either or this, or sometimes you can get Johnson & Johnson. Now Johnson & Johnson has been in the news and we'll discuss that a little bit more. Um, and we can talk about the side effects and who's at, at, um, who's at risk and what are the actual, actual risks. And so just to remind everybody, the Pfizer and the Moderna um, vaccines are 95% effective. Remember in the beginning of the pandemic, they were talking about flattening the curve. And this is exactly what they meant. They looked at the number of cases on the X axis, I mean, on the Y axis, you know, everybody who's taking math, you do, the, you do the graph. And then they looked at the number, the days after the dose, and you kind of see the number of cases. So if the patients who did not get the, um, the vaccine, the placebo, they basically gave them water, those people, you see the curve keeps going up, right? It's almost like an acetone. It's linear and then starts to become a little bit like an acetone. And then you see the people who got the vaccine. This is the BNT. That's a fancy scientific name. It's flat. And so the, the, the vaccine is so effective that it flattens the curve. This is not the lockdown. This is not the social distancing. This is not the mask. This is the vaccine in action. And I have to, I have to emphasize, zero patients during that trial were hospitalized and zero patients died. And there are no major side effects for the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. And so the major side effect that you might have to think of is um, what they call um, allergies or anaphylactic shock. But in those cases, those are severe allergy cases. And those only happen one in um, 250,000 for the Moderna. I mean, one in 250,000 for about both of them. And so it's very, very rare. So how do you think about that? One in 250,000 is like you're about your risk of getting struck by lightning. And so, if you're not worried about going outside today, you shouldn't be worried about a side effect. And even if you did have the allergies, they have nurses and doctors on staff when they give you the vaccine to um, instantly give you epinephrine or Benadryl. They can easily treat that. They can take you to an emergency room. They know how to handle allergies. They know how to handle anaphylactic shock. And so that's the Pfizer and the Moderna one. It's 95% effective in stopping. Um, and, and um, it's actually 95% effective in preventing mild COVID-19, but it's 100% effective and it prevents a severe COVID-19. And in the real world, you know, they, they studied it again, it was about 99.9% .9 effective. Very, very, very good. So if you do get this vaccine, you almost basically take the risk of getting hospitalized from COVID-19. It's very important. So that means you take the risk off dying from COVID-19. So if you get the vaccine, it's very rare that you will die from COVID-19 after vaccination. 
they only have a handful of cases of people who are fully vaccinated. And I'm, I'm pretty sure those patients are probably extremely sick or very old. So the vaccine is very good across a lot of different um, diseases and a lot of different ages. You also have the Johnson & Johnson. Um, and so the Johnson & Johnson is different from the mRNA. It uses a different technology. It's a viral vector. Basically all it is, is just, um, it's kind of a similar thing, but a little bit different. It's basically DNA that gets into your cell and then that gets made into the mRNA, just like the mRNA vaccine. And that gets made into a protein and it's, um, it's only a single dose. And so it's a one and done. And they give you one dose and then eventually um, you get the, um, the, the full antibodies to protect you. So it's nice when you do, and it's also 100% effective at preventing hospitalization. You hear a lot of people say, well, you know, the Pfizer and the, um, the Moderna one are 95% effective. Well, the Johnson Johnson one is also 100% effective at hospitalization. It's at 66% effective because it was actually tested against the South Africa strain and um, the new strains. And so it's not apples to apples comparison. You can't really compare the two. Um, but in a couple weeks ago, um, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine made the news because if it was found that um, one in a million women um, were developing these rare blood clots and they were having very low plate counts. And so um, a lot of people were concerned about it. But, you know, the um, FDA was trying to be transparent as possible. You have to remember, um, when you're trying to vaccinate millions and millions, if not billions of people around the world, you have to be um, transparent. Because if you're giving something to everybody, it has to be extremely safe. And so they said, we're going to pause it. Um, and then they had to say, okay, what do we have to know about this vaccine? Is it really causing the blood clots? Now, it's actually interesting. Um, five in one million women have the chance of developing blood clots. And so it's actually statistically, it's kind of hard to determine was the vaccine causing the blood clot or was the jo Johnson and, uh, or was the woman um, likely to develop it? And so it's kind of like they're going to put it back on. Um, one in a million is very low. You, there are a lot of things that don't have that to one in a million. Um, so you have more of a chance of dying in a car accident. You have more of a chance of dying from other things um, than one in a million. But they they probably put a caution that women who are between the ages of um, 18 and 54, those women who are still um, able to have children, they should um, they should restrain. Um, they should take caution, not restrain. Let me say that clearly. The women should take should um, talk to their doctor about the risk and benefits of getting the vaccine. And so it's still out there. It's still a great option. Not everyone has to get the mRNA. If you're a guy, it's perfectly safe. Um, if you're a woman, it's super safe for you. It's one in a million chance. That means if we if we vaccinate a church, we can vaccinate a church everybody a hundred times and we don't expect any of them to have the blood clot. And so it's very, 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 very safe. But in women, it might be linked to blood clot. And that's, I think everybody should know that. And if you want to talk about it a little bit more, you can feel free to text me or call me. I can um, walk you through it. But a lot of you will probably get the mRNA vaccines, the Pfizer and Moderna. So you shouldn't have to worry about that. And I just want to give everybody a little bit uh, of a zoom out. So we vaccinate people all the time. All the children in our church have been vaccinated. They vaccinate um, Ghanaian children all um, them too. Vaccine, vaccines are the cornerstone of medicine um, because they reduce death. And they actually are one of the most effective health um, interventions of all time. And so just to give you an idea of how good these vaccines, this, these vaccines have been developed on the scale of efficacies, they rank um, near the top three best vaccines ever developed. Um, and so that's very important. So people need to understand that, you know, we have the flu vaccine, a lot of people hate that, but the, if you look at the flu vaccine, it's only around 44% effective. So everybody's like, oh, I got the flu vaccine and I still got the flu. Yeah, because it's only 44% effective. But these vaccines are 94 and 95% effective at mild COVID and a severe COVID, the one that you're really concerned about, it's, 100, it's virtually 100% effective at stopping hospitalizations and death. That means you won't have that shortness of breath that makes you get to the hospital where they give you oxygen. It stops that. And you won't have those lungs that scar down and you, you won't learn, land in the ICU and be intubated because it's 100% virtually at stop, 100% um, effective at stopping that. That's why it's such a great um, option. That's why all the doctors, when they saw the data, they took it early on and then a lot of people started taking it on. And you see in Israel, a massive drop. We'll go over some of the, um, the data from there. Now, this is some new stuff that I didn't talk about last time. If I am fully vaccinated, can I get infected or transmitted with um, uh, transmit coronavirus? That's what a lot of people are concerned, right? It's like, okay, I got the I got the vaccine, right? I'm fully I'm fully vaccinated. It's two weeks after my second dose. Am I good to go? And so, you know, when they first um, did the trial, they didn't test everybody every day to see if uh, to see if uh, the the actual vaccine stops you from getting the virus, right? Traditionally, though, we know 
that vaccines reduce infection and transmission. That's just the case. And what is transmission? Transmission is basically you giving the virus to somebody else, right? So a lot of people are like, okay, I got a vaccine, but I'm afraid, right? Because my, my, my mother is not vaccinated. And so can I give it to her? And so they actually did, they actually did the studies and they're actually doing it, they're still doing the studies. I actually read a study yesterday that was uh, published in the Journals of American um, Medical Association. But this is some of the data. It looks a little bit complicated, but it's actually very simple, right? A lot of you know how to read bar graphs, so I'll go through it. Over here is the not vaccinated people, right? You see right here, the incidence, the incidence is basically the percentage of people who got it is about, um, sorry, the Zoom thing's blocking my way. It's 2.61, right? So the incidence is 2.61, right? So 2.61%, right, is the total incidence. And this is in hospitalized hospital workers during the surge. Remember, in January, the um, actually the pandemic was at its worst, right? We were having 250,000 to 300,000 cases a day. It was the worst in January. And this was in Texas. So this study is actually out of Texas. We looked at the University of Texas um, Southwestern in Austin, Texas, and they actually looked at the um, they actually looked at their employees and said, okay, we're gonna test everybody because everybody has to go to, um, um, go see their patients. They're gonna test them, and we're gonna see if any everybody gets um, the virus. And they compared the people who decided to take the vaccine, those the not vaccinated, to the people who did take the vaccine. And look right here, you can barely see this graph right here. It's 0 0.05, so it's. 2.61, 2.05, right? And if you actually put that in real numbers, that is 0.0005%, extremely low, right? Or if, if I will say it again, it's five, It's basically five patients, it's about five patients out of 10,000 will actually get the virus post-vaccination. Very strong data, right? But even Israel has been doing it, right? And Israel found even similar data, right? So when you do scientific studies, you want to know how correct a study is by saying if you can see the same results by somebody doing um, the study on their own, right? So if people don't do the study on their own, you can't really know if that you, you can't know if you can trust that data. But they did the studies at um, UCLA, they did the study at UCSD, they did the study um, in Cambridge, they did the study in Israel. Israel is actually the leader in vaccination. They aggressively started vaccinating people and they started tracking it meticulously. And they found that um, after vaccination, the people who had COVID infections was 0.04%. Only 317 people out of 700,000 people got it. That's extremely, extremely, extremely low. There are, way, there are so many things in health that we can do um, to prevent things, but that's extremely low. And, and, and in healthcare, when you get a percentage that low, you know something works. And um, and so, and even the uh, CDC was tracking it, right? Out of 77 million Americans, only about 5,500, uh, 5,500 Americans got the virus afterwards. And so that kind of comes out to a rate of one in 12,000. One in 12,000 is extremely low. And remember, this is during the time, this is, this is during the surge, this is during, um, these are, this is in healthcare workers, right? So these are high risk people within a lot of virus circulating. Now, as the cases come steadily come down and they continue to come down and come down, come down, your rates of actually getting the virus actually decreases. So these numbers are not even reflective of the true experience you'll have. It's actually even lower than that because as less virus circulates, it's less likely that you can get it infected. And that's how kind of how herd immunity works, right? Because the, the vaccine creates a very strong antibody response in your body. And not even antibody, it also creates a cell response. Your T cells, many of you heard that, your T cells um, actually fight the virus too. And so your T cells learn from the vaccine how to fight the virus. And so when you actually encounter the virus, right? Say you're going outside and something's not, um, say, no, so, say you're going outside and you're indoors and you're gonna sit at a restaurant and somebody doesn't have their mask on and they maybe have coronavirus. If it comes into contact with you, your body will rapidly kill it. That's, that's how it kind of works. And so it, it kills the virus before you can spread it. And PCR in, 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 um, in medicine is an extremely sensitive test. I used to do it when I was an undergrad. It's a test that we run all the time. If it detects at least maybe one or two um, coronavirus, it's enough to make the test work because what PCR does, it multiplies the virus. And so if, the, if, if you have to, to test negative, there has to be almost no virus in you. And so these people who had 0.05%, and these people who um, got this thing, they, it, it's, look, it's likely that their body is rapidly killing the virus or protecting them before they can get exposed because they're healthcare workers and, and they're in a surge in Texas. You remember how Texas is more liberal of masking. And so in these patients, I mean, in this, in this, in this study, they're very confident that the vaccine protects against the virus way better, let me say this, than mask way better than masks. And that's why the vaccine is, the, that's why it's the, the cornerstone of the US strategy to defeat the pandemic. And you can actually kind of see where Europe, 
they're still having a problem, they're still having lockdowns. You can see in um, India, massive outbreak, but you see United States, even with um, Eastern, even all these um, loosened restrictions in, in Texas and all, all over the country, but we don't see a takeoff in cases. That's because people are getting vaccinated. People are starting to get closer and closer to herd immunity. Herd immunity is just not, you know, something that happens instantly. It's something that happens, um, it's something that happens um, gradually. And so it happens on a continuous basis. And so just to give you even more, um, Dr. Walensky, who is the head of the CDC, went on Rachel Maddow, a lot of you might have watched MSNBC, but um, basically she said, they did, the CDC also did their independent studies and they found the same results. And they said, our data from the CDC today suggests that vaccinated people do not carry the virus, don't get sick. And, it's, and that is just not the clinical trials, but it's also real world data. So they've been tracking all this data this whole time to see if it works in the real world. And, it's, and it shows the vaccine is very good at stopping you from getting infected. And it's stopping, and it's very, very, very good at stopping you from getting hospitalized, it's, which is why we care. Because if people weren't getting hospitalized with the disease, this whole pandemic will not happen. There'll be no lockdowns, there'll be no social distancing. People get sick all the time. People get colds, people get flus, whatever. We care because people are getting hospitalized because it's a very deadly disease. And so once we, basically these vaccines have turn COVID-19 into a disease that's even weaker than the flu. So you get vaccinated, you have less chance of dying from COVID than you have from dying from the flu. Let me say that again. If you get vaccinated, you have less chance of dying from COVID than dying from the flu because the vaccine is that effective, right? It's almost 100% effective at, getting, at preventing death and preventing hospitalization. That's why we tell people to get vaccinated because if you get vaccinated, there's no reason why you should die from COVID-19. It's almost impossible for you to die from COVID-19. Now, if you don't, you are playing with your risk. And one in 500 Black people have died um, because they were not vaccinated, right? Or they didn't, not, not in, because they're not vaccinated, they have died from coronavirus. And so coronavirus affects more Black people because Black people are more sick in this country for various reasons, which we'll examine in this talk. So what is next for the pandemic? A lot of people are wondering what is going on. And this is very important for our church because there are gonna be a lot of decisions that have to be made in the short term uh, and things are gonna rapidly change. Things are gonna change really fast within weeks. So people need to get ready and understand what's going on. So first, um, the CDC said, if, no, if you guys missed it two weeks ago, that outside you don't have to wear a mask if you're vaccinated. It's very safe. The air ventilates the air very well. I mean, um, the natural air ventilates everything very well. It's very hard to get coronavirus outside. They, even, even people who do have coronavirus, it's very hard for them to give it to them. Out of, in uh, one study out of China, they looked at all the cases of coronavirus. And this is in Wuhan, right? And China tracks their citizens, very aggressive um, contact traders. And they're able to track who had it very well. Out of the 7,300 um, 7, cases that they did for their study, only one was linked to outside. Now even, they're not even sure if it was outside. And so it's very hard for the vaccine, I mean, the virus to get you, um, to get inside of you once you're outside. And they say it actually takes 15 minutes of exposure to someone who's infectious, right? So your body can naturally kill a couple of coronaviruses. It can kill maybe a couple of million, but if you're sitting there and breathing in lots of coronavirus particles, then you get infected. And so um, they did a study to show that people outside are very unlikely to get the virus. And that's why the CDC said, the CDC is very conservative. CDC is afraid to make recommendations that'll get people hurt. And so the CDC said, you don't have to mask outside if you're vaccinated. And even if you are vaccinated, you don't have to mask. I mean, you don't even have to get, you don't have to quarantine after you get somebody who, after you get exposed to somebody who's COVID positive. Let me say that again. You don't have to quarantine after vaccination. So you, the people who are vaccinated, they don't have to quarantine um, to, um, they don't have to quarantine with people um, after they've been exposed to um, coronavirus. And so that's important to know. Another thing that's changing is the New York, uh, York Tri-State area, that's Connecticut, New York, and New Jersey, they are lifting restrictions. Most of the restrictions start in May 19th. And so we're seeing the cases fall. They're going to get very aggressive over here and stopping restrictions. So all the people who are tired of all the COVID restrictions, they're basically gonna come to an end starting May 19th. And so a lot of the gyms are gonna be fully, I mean, getting uh, fully open, restaurants are gonna be um, dining in, a lot of the things are gonna change. And then even more so, de Blasio, the mayor of New York said, New York will be fully reopened on July 1st. Let me say that again, New York will be fully reopened on July 1st. That means life goes back to normal. There might be some masking in place, but that means there's no, there's no gonna be no capacity limits. Um, virtually, I think they might do some different changes for theaters, but basically indoors will be returned to the similar capacities, outdoor spaces um, will go back to normal. 
Um, then I'll also say this, the, the train service is gonna be 24 hours again, starting May 19th. And so New York City is gonna come back online. And so everything is opening up. Churches will be open, everything's gonna be open up. So we have to prepare for that. And just to give everybody an idea, more than 1.25 billion shots have already been given for the COVID vaccine. It's one of the greatest efforts in human history to vaccinate people. This is the biggest vac vaccine campaign, campaign in history. And remember, the vaccine has only been around six months and they've already gotten 1.25 billion different, different vaccines around the world in people. Even when I went to Ghana a couple weeks ago, they are starting to vaccine, uh, vaccinate people there. Ghana already started vaccinating people um, in March. Um, even one of my family members in Ghana got the vaccine. And so this is what they're doing. This is a global effort. It's happening very fast. We need to stay on top of it. And just to give people an idea, um, this is the, um, the vaccination rates in the United States. Um, this is the number of people who are getting vaccinated. So this is actually coming from one of the um, best modelers in the pandemic. His name is Yu Yang Gu. He's an MIT graduate. He's actually my age, he's 27, brilliant kid. He decided, okay, I'm gonna actually track the cases myself. In the beginning where everyone's not sure how many cases will come and how many things will, um, you know, how things will go, he was actually the one to accurately predict things. And so a lot of, uh, a lot of institutions started following him and he looks at the vaccination rates. And so there's a difference between herd immunity and normality. I try to talk about this to people, but in this country, we're not really gonna get to herd immunity, but we will get to normality. And what does that mean? We're gonna loosen all the restrictions, right? So the government is basically saying, we're not gonna do any restrictions really going forward after we open up. The government is basically saying, our strategy is to get everybody the vaccine. And then people, a lot of people think about COVID-19 is for a lot, the vast majority of people, about 99, maybe 98% of people will beat it. The people are at risk, unfortunately, they might not beat it. So they have to protect themselves. But the government is basically saying, we have such an effective vaccine that's nearly 100% effective at stopping people from dying. It's let, it, makes the vac, it, makes the, it makes the COVID-19 weaker than the flu. There's no reason why we should have restrictions. And so the government, you know, they're gonna try their best to get close to herd immunity, but they're not gonna stop these, um, these um, reopenings from happening this summer. And so things are gonna back, rapidly change. Um, and we'll probably project that uh, maybe 200 million Americans will get vaccinated. Um, by the end of summer. And so this is where the case count is going. This is a projection of the case count. And so right now we're at 50,000 cases and we probably get down to about um, 20,000 cases, which is very low, you know. Uh, and at that point, it's extremely hard to get the coronavirus, right? When it's circulating like this and people who are vaccinated, it even drives it even lower. And so you see these curves are very, very close to the bottom um, from our peak. And you see the peak right here over here very high and so we're getting close to a point where this pandemic is really coming to an end so what do we need to do as a church we need to build a registry of who's vaccinated and who's not now we obviously have to respect people's health privacy but if we're having in-person services if we keep track of how many people are vaccinated and who's not then we understand how much risk we have if everybody in church is basically vaccinated say 80 or 90 percent of our members it'd be very reasonable to not wear masks right we can sing we can hug we can do whatever without masks but until we get a certain amount of people vaccinated in church until it's that safe it's probably to be masks so if you want to go to a church that's normal where people can you know wear the makeup or people can hug and whatever and do things like we used to people need to get vaccinated or prove that you had coronavirus and you can actually get that for free you can do that antibody test through new york city we also need to prepare plans to open the church this spring or summer. What is the plan that we have in place? I'm not part of the health ministry. I don't mind helping. I don't mind talking to people. But what plan do we have in place for opening? New York City said July 1st, everything's opening. And church are a priority in, in any way. So it's probably likely beforehand. So, you know, you're going to see things from the conference come down. So how do we get this going? Also, we need to offer a hybrid model, right? Some people are going to be a little hesitant. Some people are going to be a little afraid. I will say... On, on, I'll go on the record. If you're vaccinated, I feel like you should not feel afraid um, to go to church after you're vaccinated. The risk is very low and the amount of virus circulation is going to be extremely low. It's going to be very hard for you to actually get hurt if you're vaccinated. So I just encourage you, once you get vaccinated, come back into the church, come in person, you'll be fine. The numbers say that, but there are going to be certain people who are afraid. And so we have to figure out what is the hybrid model, right? So I'm saying this now because things are going to happen very quickly, right? This, this could be in this month. This could be next month definitely by the summer. So this is happening right now. Um, and so that is what I have to say. We can talk about that in our final discussion. But I, the last talk I really want to talk about is why are Black men dying before everyone? It's Adventist 
Health Men's Day. I mean, I mean it's Adventist Men's Ministry. And so we're going to talk about men's issue. And actually, this is actually an issue that we don't actually talk about a lot in medicine. There's not much written about. We have a lot of information on Black women's health, a lot of information on Black people in general. We have a lot of information on health in general, but Black men as a specific population that have special concerns and special needs. And there are a lot of things that we need to address. And Black men, you'd be surprised are actually the most unhealthy people in this country. They die the earliest in this country. And it's not just complete, it's not, it's not just mass incarceration and police shooting. It's actually to have the worst health. And so why is this the case? And we're gonna, we're gonna dive a little bit deeper into that. And so over here, we have a graph. It looks a little bit complicated, but I want to show you guys the numbers so you understand and start thinking like, you know, thinking like doctors and nurses thinking like scientists understand it's very actually pretty simple if you understand a little bit of math a little bit of graphs actually pretty simple a lot of just multiplication and add in addition it's very simple so over here the people who are most likely to live the longest in this country are white females on the opposite end the people who the exact opposite the people who are most likely to die are black males and look at this black women actually live longer than white men so black women actually doing really well with their health compared to black men and they're actually catching up to white people. So you, you know, a lot of shout out to a lot of the black women, they're actually doing much better in our health. But look at this massive gap. The average life expectancy of a black man in this country is about 72, 73 years. Very low. The average life expectancy for somebody who's 81, I mean somebody who is a white female is 81. And so there's a massive gap. People are like, oh, that's only 73, but that's actually a massive, massive, massive number. That basically means you have a 10% shorter life. Right. And so all these premature deaths are happening. This is the average age. So there's not a lot of people who would have fall, died before that. And a lot of people who are a little, a little bit be, uh, beyond that. But this is the average age uh, that you are expected to die at. And so what are the leading causes of deaths in the United States for black men? The top leading cause of death is heart disease. Right. So people who have a heart problem, people who have heart failure, people who have a heart attack, people who have hypertension. Hypertension is a risk factor for heart disease. So that is one of the leading causes. The second leading cause is cancer. So all different types of cancer, prostate cancer, colon cancer, lung cancer, you name it, kidney cancer. A lot of it, black men are at risk for. Unintentional injuries. What does that mean? Reckless behavior, right? So maybe driving, right? Maybe into a car accident, you know, how you drive is actually a very big factor in how long you live. And so one of the things that can kill you is driving. And so it's crazy how I tell people to get vaccinated. The vaccine's less likely to kill you more than you driving a car and how you drive. And so that's something to think about. Homicide. In, in the United States, Black men get killed. The, the, the police shootings, they get killed, including African Black men, right? I'm a, I, I, um, I, I'm a dude, Diablo, Diallo, who um, in, the nine, in the late 90s was killed by the NYPD. So, you know, our young Black men are still not being seen differently by the cops. Um, as compared to the African-American men who are from this country. Um, stroke is one of the leading causes. Diabetes, a lot of diabetes is actually in our population. Actually, we study diabetes at the NIH. And actually, we found in our African population from Sub-Saharan Africa, we did uh, a lot of people from West Africa, a lot of people from East Africa, a lot of people from South Africa, and a lot of people from Central Africa. The rates of diabetes and pre-diabetes combined is about 50%. So about 50% of people from the ages of about six, 40 to 60, or about those that middle age have diabetes or um, pre-diabetes. So they're in that range where they can just tip over to diabetes. The big problem, it's a big, big, big problem. And so a lot of us are having diabetes. I study this specific population. I study people like us in the church, right? People who actually, are my study population, people who were actually born in Ghana, born in Kenya, born in South Africa, born in Angola, those type of people, we study at the NIH for my specific, uh, my specific study and we look at the eye disease. I'm just telling you about the injections into your eye. That's what I study. And we know for a fact that a lot of you have diabetes. A lot of you, about half of you are pre-diabetic or diabetic. Very big problem. Um, chronic lower respiratory disease like asthma, kidney disease, very big problem. One of the complications of diabetes is kidney disease. So if you have bad diabetes, you get bad eyes, you also get bad kidneys. This is a very big disease and also get an increased risk for heart disease. And then you also septicemia, which is basically infection. And then the last thing is hypertension. Those are the leading causes of deaths. And I have to say this, a lot of black men think COVID-19 is not a problem for them, but black men are the most likely people to die from COVID-19. The people most at risk are black men. So this is Adventist Men's Health Day. Black men 
are the most likely to die from COVID-19. They are six times more likely to die from COVID-19 than white men. Something to think about in the back of your head when people say, oh, COVID doesn't matter. No, it matters six times more for you because you are the person that the COVID coronavirus is killing. It's not killing but white people, like it's killing you. And also just for everybody, for the women in the crowd, it kills three times as many black women, I mean, black people as it does white people. And so a lot of you are saying, you know, that's just, you know, African-Americans, the cuts of people, all of them, that doesn't matter. No, the truth is African immigrants have worse health than African-American men. Let me say that again, African immigrants have worse health than African-American men. So the idea that, oh, well, it's just black people in this country. No, you guys as a people have worse health, particularly the African immigrant men have worse health. And this is actually one of my, uh, one of the professors I work with, Ann Summer, Sumner, she's done a lot of work um, in Africans. Her study is called Africans in America. She studies the health of African populations. And she found that African immigrants were less obese, that's good, but had worse cardiometabolic health. What does that mean? They had worse heart, they had more diabetes, they had higher levels of glucose, it means they had higher levels of sugar in their body, that means they had higher levels of diabetes, they had more hypertension, and they had greater organ fat. Well, that's what we call visceral adiposity. Overall, at, we think that immigrants are actually more, African immigrants are actually more healthy, they're actually not. Particularly African men, those born in Ghana, those came from Ghana, all of you, the people in the audience, you guys actually have worse health than the worst health group in this country. So this is why I'm presenting this stuff because I want people to understand that this is not a joke. This is not something we take lightly. This is very important for us. And so this matters to us. We need to do more work on it. I'm doing work on it at the NIH. There are people who are doing work on it. There are people doing studies, but we need more doctors. We need more nurses. We need more health professionals, but we also need other people in other fields and politics to advocate for our issues. But we also need to take care of ourselves individually because a lot of us, we eat, we eat fufu, we eat plantains, we eat all these different foods. We eat a lot of oil, we eat a lot of starch, we eat a lot of meats, goat meat, piling up, piling up, piling up, jollof, piling up, piling up, piling up. But that is actually what's killing us. And America's killing us too with the stress. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. The stress is killing a lot of people. So we have to start taking our health seriously because you are gonna die for the African men, the Adventist men is like is way more than likely that you will die before your wife. And a lot of you are like, oh, I don't care. It matters because you're gonna leave them behind. You'll leave your family behind, unfortunately. And so remember a lot of people remember Chadwick Boseman. Chadwick Boseman was, you know, Black Panther. He died from colon cancer. And he died at a particularly young age. And so some people ask, why, uh, why are rates of disease higher in young black men? Why are rates of colon cancer higher in black, uh, younger black men? And so colon cancer is really, really damaging um, black men. And so that's a big problem. And then prostate cancer, well, we don't talk about it a lot. A, a lot of men don't take care of their prostate. And so one in four black men, one in four, right? So you take me, Stephen, Paul, and Julius, or us four, one of us will have prostate cancer in our lifetime. That is a big problem, one in four of us. It's, that means one in four people will get cancer. That's, that's, immense, that's a crazy number, they'll get prostate cancer. A lot, of, a lot of black men also get benign prostate hyperplasia, BPH, basically when they have to go to the bathroom, they're urged to go to the bathroom. So these are issues that we have, right? But the thing is in medicine, we also have screening tests. You catch the cancer early, you can do surgery, you can do chemotherapy, you can take care of it. You can cure it early, but a lot of black men don't go to a doctor. They are afraid to talk about these things. They catch it late. And unfortunately, there's not much we can do. So the question is, why are black men dying younger than everyone else? Why do black men have the worst health? Why do African immigrant men have worse health than black men who are born in this country? Well, this so there's certain there have been studies to look at this. The first thing is. Black men are 50% less likely to have gone to a doctor in the last year. Everyone knows my father's a primary care doctor. A lot of you see him, right? But the people are probably, I don't know his numbers, but I can probably bet if I look at his numbers, he probably has more women that he sees than men on occasion. I think the women tend to be more proactive about taking care of their health issues, establishing care than men, because black men are 50% more less likely to have gone to a doctor in the last year. I could talk to a lot of my black friends. If I talk to people my age, I ask you, who's your primary care doctor? They don't know. They don't know. My primary care doctor is my parents, but I should really have a primary care doctor. And so primary care is essential because you establish that care, you know for a lot, you're, you're following your health. You're getting ahead of things. You, you have hypertension, 
It's better to catch the hypertension at 30 where you can do lifestyle changes and take the diets. A lot of people love dieting. A lot of people love the health changes. A lot of people love the remedies. But you do that when, at a young age. You don't do that when you're 60 or 70. At that point, your body is not that be able to change. So people don't understand if you, if you catch it early, yes, you can take the, the dietary and the, um, the exercise approach. You catch that late. Those things help, but it's not enough. It's not better than the hypertension medication. So if you really want to avoid that kind of stuff, you start seeing your doctor early. Another reason why we die at a young age, the macho man, right? I'm tough, you know, I'm strong, you know? A lot, I see this, I see this a lot of behavior, right? Where a lot of men, you know, I'm not trying to come on men, but a lot of men, you know, we don't like to be vulnerable, right? We don't like to say we have problems. We like to be the strength of the family, right? We like to be the cornerstone of the family, the foundation, right? So a lot of men, it's crazy that we, we're trying to be strong, but a lot of men are actually afraid to go to the doctor. Because if you're getting a yearly screening, you should know your numbers, you should know everything, right? I should ask you, when's your last, what was your last blood pressure reading? Oh, that was six months ago. What was it? Oh, it was 115 over uh, 75. And you should know that off the top of your head. Okay, what was your glucose? Oh, my glucose was 85. Those are the things you should know, right? You know you're in good health, right? But a lot of us don't know because we don't want to know, right? We know that we eat bad. We know that we don't exercise. We know that we work double shifts. We don't want to know. And so that behavior of not knowing or being afraid to go to the doctor, that white coat hypertension, that a fear of a doctor is why a lot of men die early because they don't establish care. So that's why I tell people to go to get vaccinated because you need to start establishing care with the in contact with the healthcare system. Which brings me to my next point, discrimination and racism in healthcare. We can't talk about the healthcare system without acknowledging the discrimination and the racism within the system, right? You as a black man will be treated horribly by the system, right? The good thing is we have people like my father, we have people like my mother, we have people like my sister, we have black providers who are doing the work to try to mitigate that, right? Because if a doctor sees you as a human, they'll treat you well. Most doctors, I would say, will treat you fairly, right? Because we have guidelines, we have rules that we have to follow, we get sued if we do certain things. But there is bias in, in how they see you, there is bias how they hear a story, there is bias in how they treat you. And so that's something to be aware of. So racism and discrimination is a factor in why black men are dying. And also leads to why black men tend to um, have more just distrust in the healthcare system. You talk to a lot of people like, yo, why don't you go to the doctor, man? I don't trust it, you know? They say, oh, why don't you do this? You know, I don't know, right? They, they, they have this distrust, right? A lot of people talk about syphilis, right? The, the um, you know, the Tuskegee experiment. And I also have that conversation when people say, oh, the Tuskegee experiment, because the Tuskegee experiment was not the government actually giving people syphilis. That's what a misconception is. Oh, the government injected people with syphilis. No, what happened was the black men had syphilis and they had a cure. They started the studies in the 1930s they actually started in 1932, and in, 19, and in the 1940s, penicillin was discovered. Now, everybody knows if you get syphilis, everybody in medicine knows if you get syphilis, you get one person, uh, one gram of um, penicillin, it's cured. What they don't know is that they, what people don't understand is that the black men didn't know that, so, right? So this is a new cure, and then instead of telling them, they decided to continue with the study. So the, the men in Tuskegee, they watched them for 30 years after, I mean, they, they watched them for 30 years after penicillin was discovered. And so that's why, you know, they had bad um, syphilis. And that's what people keep bringing up because the government watched people get sick and even die. And so that's the, 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 the neglect, right? So now you have coronavirus. What is the lesson from that? It's not that the government's going to give it to you. The government, can, the government will watch you die. That's the difference, right? And so the idea is that a lot of us understand that from history. And that's why we want to get people the cure to coronavirus, which is the vaccine. It's very safe. And it's shown to um, reduce transmission, infection, and death and hospitalization. And so uh, another reason why is there's too few black doctors. You'd be surprised, you know, I've been reading about this all week. Only 3% of doc all, all doctors are black males. And so it's very hard to find people like my father, um, very hard to find young black men, pe people like um, Dr. Atakutin, people like that, you're not gonna see a lot of medicine. Those are very rare exceptions. And so to find a black doctor who understands your disease is very rare. Even my sister, like you, it's gonna be hard to find a black ob guy like my sister to take care of your pregnancy. And so we need more black males and females to go into medicine and to really help us to fight this racism and to um, treat our people better. So what can you do, right? Because I gave you all the problems I want you to understand. Um, you need to start to build healthy habits, right? What are healthy habits, right? You know exercise, you know health, um, healthy eating. No, but start establishing care with a primary care doctor. If I ask you, who's your doctor? You should be able to say, this person. You know, it doesn't matter if it's my father, it's established care. Better yet, it's even better with a black doctor, to be honest. There's studies to show that 
it's better to have a black patient with a black doctor. And so establish care with a primary care doctor or a primary, or a primary care nurse practitioner, establish care, because that is gonna give you the numbers that you need to make decisions on your health. Which brings me to the second point, know your numbers. What is your blood pressure? What is your diabetes status? Do you have diabetes? Do you not have diabetes? Are you pre-diabetic? If you're pre-diabetic, that means you're on the tipping point. If you find out you're pre-diabetic, you better start controlling your diet. You better start exercising. You better start making the right changes. You better start seeing your doctor more and seeing your diabetes, see if you're, you're, you're going in the right direction, if your numbers are going in the right direction. If they're not, you can start making changes. What is your cholesterol? What is your weight? These are important questions to ask yourself. Next point is get screened for cancer. We talked about this. Colon cancer killed Chadwick Bozeman at a very young age, 43. Now, not everybody has to start getting um, colon cancer screenings at that age. We actually recommend that black men get colon, uh, colonoscopies before everyone. Why? Oh, is it the healthcare system to make money? No, because black men typically develop colon cancer at an earlier age, right? All the meat that you eat, all the, the unrefined foods, you eat all the pano and all the, the foods that's not, it's, that's not um, refined and healthy, that increases your chance for colon cancer. So if you can eat whole wheat, you know, fibrous food, brown rice, things that um, scrape your colon and scrape it clean, that kind of reduces your chance. But you need to get a colon, uh, colonoscopy. And your primary care doctor refers you to the um, gastroenterologist who gives you your colonoscopy. And that's only done every 10 years. And so you get the bowel prep and then they, then they put the camera there, they put you on an anesthesia, you don't feel anything. They do the colonoscopy and they make sure everything's clean. And that will reduce your chance because colon cancer grows very slowly. So if you catch it early, very easy to treat. Well, not easy, but it's, it's treatable um, and curable. You catch it late, you know, it's very hard to treat. Prostate cancer, the prostate. So the prostate is basically a gland, glands around, um, around a lot of your, uh, the, um, the penis area, right? It's not on your penis, but it's a little bit higher. It's around your, where the urine flows, right? You're around your urethra. And that is a problem. So what they have is a blood test called the PSA, um, prostate specific antigen, or they have um, they have um, a prostate exam. Everybody doesn't want to get a prostate chance because they always think about the digital rectal exam, but you can get your numbers to it. My dad does it all the time. So you can think about getting a prostate cancer screen and you should start that at age 55. Um, what else can you do? Eat healthy and exercise. Um, you should be able to um, you should be getting 150 minutes of exercise every week. You should be exercising with strength training. Strength training is really, really good. And so one of the best ways to get your diabetes under control is actually to do strength training. Why? Because strength training does anaerobic um, metabolism, right? So anaerobic and exercises, you, and you hear aerobic, right? And so aerobic is when you, you know, you run and get your heart beating and you're breathing heavily. Anaerobic is when you are lifting weights and burning that sugar, right? Because it's using the anaerobic metabolism, the burning the sugar, to lower your, um, the sugar in your body. And so one of the best things you can do for diabetes is to start strength training. Why? Because you build more muscle, it's harder for that insulin resistance to happen. You treat your diabetes by actually doing that strength training. So if you have diabetes, one thing you can do is start to lift weights. Get a membership to the gym, first get vaccinated, then go to the gym, start lifting weights, start getting that under control. Start uh, walking. Walking is a great aerobic exercise. If you can, you can run a little bit, but start to lose weight. Weight loss is one of the best measures you can do to lower your hypertension, to lower your um, to lower your uh, hyperglycemia, your, your sugar in your blood. Those are the great interventions you can do. What else is another uh, thing you can do? And I'm about to finish up. Um, you need to get more sleep, right? Sleeping is incredibly important. A lot of people say, oh, I don't care about sleep. They don't, they don't think about sleep. Sleep is critical, right? If you're not getting seven to eight hours of sleep, you have a problem. And there's this idea called sleep hygiene, right? Sleep hygiene is proper sleep in Hyvex, right? What are those? Um, a dark room, a cool room, a quiet room, going to sleep at the same time, right? If you're going, if you're taking, if you're doing doubles, double doubles, and you're, you know, some people don't have the luxury of having the same time, your body has a rhythm, a circadian rhythm. So your body will not let you sleep. So you don't get the sleep, your hyper, you start to get more, your blood pressure starts to go up. You start to get to feel more stressed. You get more irritable. You need sleep. Your body doesn't recover as well. You start to age faster. So you, sleeping is very important. So what don't you do during sleep, before you sleep? Turn off the lights, no electronics, right? TV in your room can be a very bad thing, right? If, you, if you're gonna go to sleep, turn off the TV. You also have on your cell phones, um, the night mode. That helps to reduce that blue light that gives you. That blue light keeps you up. You, you wanna have warm light, more of a reddish color. And you, they have signs on your phone. Talk to the um, high tech people in the, in the 
the technology department, they can help you with that. Um, no coffee, we shouldn't be drinking coffee anyway, no alcohol. And so if you do that, you, um, you reduce um, the disturbances on your sleep, no overeating, right? Because you don't want to eat too much before you sleep. It's okay to eat a little bit, but you get your stomach really full, your stomach's all active, it feels horrible and you can't sleep. You should start getting your sleep under control. And if you do all that and you can't sleep, you really have to think about mental health things. One of your stress responses in your body is sleep. A lot of, if I talk to African men about mental health, they don't want to talk about it. They don't even know how to talk about it. It's like, whatever, what is that? That's just the American thing. But the thing is, in Ghana, they have the similar rates of uh, depression and anxiety as they do over here. So it's not like it's an American thing. How do we know that? One of the things we look for when somebody has anxiety or depression is sleep disturbances. Can you sleep, right? You ask them that. They'll be like, no. And so we know that it probably is something that's stressing you out, right? Something's on your mind, right? You're worried about a bill, you're worried about a death, you're worried about you know, your kids, that, you're worried about your spouse. Those kinds of things cause your stress in your body and then it doesn't allow your body to feel relaxed and sleep. And so a sign that you cannot, you have mental health problems is sleep. There are many other signs, but we need to start taking uh, mental health more seriously. We need to discuss that. I can do a whole lecture about that, but we need to take it seriously. And so what are the things that keep um, that our stresses for black men? Um, money, racism, jobs, relationships, and health loans, stuff I already discovered, discussed. And um, adult black men are 27% more likely to experience serious mental health problems compared to the general population. So black men, I mean, bl uh, blacks in particular have more mental health problems than whites. It's a myth that we don't have mental health problems and it's a white man issue. White men are actually more comfortable. White women are more comfortable because it's their country and it's, it's um, you know, um, there's less stresses for them. We have way more, more stress. And if you're an African immigrant, you have even more stress. You're thinking about the family you got to take care of in Ghana and all their issues that they have to deal with. That's on you. And so that is a serious concern. You can need to address it. Consider therapy. Therapy is very good. I can talk a lot more about it if you want to learn about how, what it is, what it isn't. You can hold, do a whole session, a whole afternoon program on that. I think it'll be very informative. Lastly, what can you do? Trust in God. There's only so much you can do. There's so many things about your health that are out of control. If you trust in God that he'll handle it, you will be fine. And I wanna leave with three Bible verses because I think it, it, it speaks to what we talked about. The first is where no counsel is, the people fall, but in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Proverbs 11, 14. We need to all take wisdom from other people. We're not experts in everything. We have a pastor for a reason. He's an expert in spirituality. We have doctors and nurses for a reason. They're expert in health. We have um, people who are artists for a reason. They're expert in art. There's people who have their place, right? The body talks about um, the church being a body, which each with their own parts and each with their own functions. And so we have to respect other people's expertise, right? Just because you're a doctor doesn't mean you know everything, right? Somebody teaches choir, a choir practice. You can be a doctor and not know anything about singing. And so we have to all respect each other's um, different gifts and talents. And then another one is my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because you have rejected the knowledge. After this talk, I've told you all you need to know about the vaccine. I told you all you need to know about men's health issues. I told you what we do. Um, and you know the numbers now, you know the risks now. So now you have the knowledge. The question is, will you reject it? And the last one, this is one of my favorite Bible verses, because I think it, it speaks to a lot of what we do in medicine. I think I believe in preventative medicine because I see my mother, my, my, my father, my sister practice it. And I think it's the cornerstone of medicine. Why I care about vaccines It's not all just about surgery and fancy techniques. A lot of medicine is small things, eating right, doing the right things, the small things every day that leads to better things. And the Bible says, do not despise these small beginnings for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. Zechariah 4 verse 10. And so that's the end of my presentation. And I will open up the floor to questions. Okay, David, uh, today, dear, <laughs> you have done very, very, very good job. Tim Pabucho, see, you're beautiful. Oh, a question, I'm on as well. You're beautiful, and I will contribute. Oh, my, as well. You're beautiful, my audio. Oh, my, you're beautiful.
Yeah, um, David, um, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I have a, one question. Um, you're talking about the vaccine and mm -hmm. going back to church. And I think what most of our church leaders is afraid of is um, the airflow in our church. Since we don't have any direct window, you know, to the church. So with the vaccine and, you know, even social distancing, do you think it's so safe for the kind of like structure that we have, you know, for us to go back to church? That's a great question. Short answer, yes, it's very safe. Um, the CDC already has guidelines for everybody who's vaccinated that they're able to meet inside, no mask, they can hug, they can do anything they want. That's if you're vaccinated. I know a lot of people don't want to be vaccinated. Now, the government said it's fully reopened July 1st. They're gonna put the guidelines for churches. I'm actually in Maryland. A lot of churches are actually open right now. They have masks and stuff. I actually been to one of my friend's churches um, that they um, have their, their church in person. Some of the Ghanaian churches actually do offer in-person churches, um, depending on the state. And so people are gathering. The question is, are we gonna gather like we did in the past? We can definitely do that. It's very safe and it's very possible within 2021. But the question is, are people all gonna do their part? Are everybody, is everybody who needs to get vaccinated gonna do that? There's gonna be a lot of people like, no, I don't want to. If you don't want to, don't come to church. To be honest, don't come to in person to church. You can, I mean, at a certain point, the, the levels of the virus are gonna be very low, but if you do not want to get vaccinated, you pose a risk to other people because you can spread the virus. And I guarantee you, our church, we, you know, we are, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of healthy, strong people, but you don't wanna test the coronavirus. Uh, there are people who work in healthcare, you don't wanna test them. So if everybody gets vaccinated, we have vaccine numbers that are close to herd immunity. The church actually provided guidance. And I, a lot of people say, oh, you know, end time prophecy or this, that. I discussed that in my previous lecture. I can look up, I can pull up to you what the general conference said. They got ahead of it. They discussed this in December, that it's not the mark of the beast. And we also know in medicine, there's no such thing as a microchip. It's actually physically impossible to put a microchip. It doesn't mess up your DNA because RNA is destroyed in your, in your cell before it can get into your, into your nucleus. And it, it is destroyed rapidly before it gets anywhere and does any damage. That's actually why it's really hard for them to study because actually developed the technology for the last 30 years. It's well studied, the trials are really well done. If we get the vaccine and everybody gets it, we can go back to normal, we can pack, we can pack the, um, you know, um, the, um, the room where we eat the food, doesn't matter, we can pack the pews, it's gonna get back to normal. Um, so I'll say this, society's gonna get back to normal. The masking is not gonna stay here forever. That's just the case. The government's not gonna tell everybody to mask forever. They're not gonna tell everybody to social distance. That's coming to an end first. And you'll see masking slowly fall away. So things are gonna get back to normal. The question is, how do you behave? If you have the vaccine and, and you understand the numbers, and we understand, we did a lot of studies. We look at this a lot. The government has spent billions of dollars to understand this issue. They have an interest. So people are always, why, why does the government care? Because the government needs people to go to work, right? You can say they don't care about anything, but they like you to work. One thing you can't work if you're at home and you're afraid. And so the government wants people to get back to work. They don't want everybody to die in the world. They need people to work, right? To, um, you know, fulfill the interest of the very rich. And so part of that is getting people to be safe. And part of that is getting people to go back to closed spaces. Churches will open up, masks will eventually come to an end. Things will get back to normal. Question is, will you get back to normal? And how fast do we get back to normal? That's really up to this church. And that goes by member by member, what each member decides to do and how the leadership responds. But that's a good question. Okay, thank you, David. Uh, what do you for? Confuse you. Mike and Pacho, what are you here? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Thank you. So we can definitely, we can get back to normal this year. We can even do it this summer, to be honest, if people are vaccinated and they can prove it. Yeah. The max will be over and life will come to normal. This is great. Yeah, yeah, it will be. What do you feel, Pacho? What do you do there, by? You're on mute. Okay, maybe I know you. I'm one again. What's that now? David, what can we be to say? Yeah, in Africa for your rescue. Yeah, we are close. Yeah, you need rescue. 
Because the But the reason why yeah 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 health i yeah i mean i make a and i best say the western world has destroyed african culture that's and i might destroy your life in your whole thing now that's true that's period true. because a cancer i you can watch him you're trying to cry you're coming your boobie says that you come on first of all you know man first of all you know but that's not you need calling cancer and it's a brain you mean it's been your it's true why a dinner year, dear, you say, you only and never go came with the brain. Yang a cotty contumely, fresh one. Now, so go Ghana, a cacane, a dog for pet. Now, Oceana and Cancom, Emre, none of the three by itself, ill two. Near day, yet I had been a deep. Be a fresh and let Sandman go near the catcher, they say, mass production. And you only know, Bessie, and from we are Sassinate and Yemen in fifteen ten. And then, see, yes, we are penning for the year, and I hear Jimmy Jimintino. I use that word because it's hard. And I do not say any of you can't 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 a word as a swap. No move you in me. And then you can't get a kung wamo. And the reason why we are dying or we are receiving all this uh, 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 disease in here, white culture, and that's a Western world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Imagine. Is it going to be a chromacy? And you're not going to be a chromacy. Yeah, you know, pizza, a, a hard dog, whatever it is. And you might be a year, dear, and a share, okay, black a neighborhood. And you might be a cheap, how about white neighborhood, a year expensive. So, my channel, and you might a tunnel, a black neighborhood, no, a year poison. They're cheap because they want them to eat and die. They raise taxes so people say blacks don't need them now, and it's true and it's fact. Energy, say the addition here, Kenyan. Yeah, yeah, cousin, 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 ah, yeah, yeah. African for Asians are the way. And see, I'm going to say, if you're not here, you know, I bet boy, I'm not saying boy. I'm not for move on. Me at my age of sixty-two, no. I'm not no more here, man. I said physically, no. Me want dancing, no. Because me encourage them, no. A be a new year, they might be different. No, they're different. They buy so, they're different. Yeah, yeah. They see quite a few. Oh, you see, yeah, big thing. Yeah, yeah, big thing. Yeah, big thing. Over Chrome, I've been there. Why not? Yeah. Because I saw fake vegetarian and meat, no fish. No, you know, no. Saw any man, no. And children, no, my brother, oh my, I'm not dead, dead. No, you know, cause so broad pressure. I can't be a, be a also me a vegetarian. I don't know. Oh, can't stop. I don't know your blood pressure. I know your animal. But and your man, your dear man, your mama can't say you are vegetarian. Oh my God! And your man will be oh my, as same. And it is the cry, the cry. Obi are we now? No, because the whole day is Obi are we vegetarian? Why? Because Obi are and now because on COVID yet, and 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 then you got all the disease. In tea, at the end of the year, and your partner, David Jacklin, but say, Yay, tell on your media, be a beer, and so on. Nanka, you tell your chrome, and so I'm a young man, you know, and you have a good chrome, I see a young man now. Oh, who said, Kayama Crasso, almost on the acquiring, say, you need your chrome on, Nestle, you know, near green, say, no one's a say, and near my wing now, and San Fabro Muku. And see, yes, you are, you two one or more say, I say, Nest, I'm Daniel Bay. David Mochre and Jenny Bayer, Moncantre and say, Oh, ever pan Munya say, Munya say, Nayamuna, not fair down, because a moment, yeah, Hannah Mo, Yaum, Hannah Mufri. There's a lot of things, sir. Mamma to Monsieur, a bit more boy. Nay, and yet, and yet, come on, man. You know, yet, I say, What is your mind? I mean, shut up. No more when you're sending him, dear Mo. Thank you, D4. Amen. Me pressure me, Boaca Cra. Okay, and what the other? Passer, 
Uti send your wish tree mono canea ye wo yin cras ye kofu membre any in contumere nin ye kika hua ye nye free yen fu mono chese na hodi wumpa ye di din sabre ni m se nya funti ni ye di sen nyam ya se da pa na wodi sanye mano em my and ne san ya nya ye di ni na ye process and winti eko fa ya repi a bre. Inti senia a head for so tre no. And ye many people wa a bani at na ye ho ya en ye ye. But ye wa hu kwa si as a son ye may be. O mo tre and sen ye nya ye di no as ye ye ma a ye plant based. And as a beb ben ye 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 nya midi ma ye no ye for free as a simono. Ye ha se ye ban wum se ye di ni mani piaba. Ye bay re ni ye bo de ni ye and the kwa unsu swen yina ye si biwa ha. In your free hand, contumere in your kick and home. Ain't she said, and treachera ye had a forno de maya and ye named the forno de maya and said, O mubia, ye mubia, ya drink said. Ye best chassia yen sacrias and ye binima chassia yenua. She said, Yam holding Cassiapa and a bebray. Let us say, exercise ya, Abba, the bea ye can't watch me. Be be anywhere, it try exercise. No cranny be be anywhere, try exercise. Say, oh, yes, exercise now did ye can one. Obey the bed two hundred years. Now, so only me say any pa ye two year who see all my exercise, you know, is never miss any peppy, but barber can home, and a person be she would be under sooner said. A war yenian crown crown ho set and church no a year tieno, yet the bayage. Doctor, but I but I just like to add a quick comment. You know, okay. Professor made a great point. Exercise, you know, a lot of people eat well, but they don't exercise. Exercise is great for hypertension and great for diabetes. And how could you, uh, one thing that I learned for the people that like technology, I got an Apple Watch, right? Apple Watch for me has been great, right? It really helped me to get back into shape and, and to exercise a lot more because it allows me to track how much calories I actually burn every day. Right, so right now it gives you the you can't see you that well, but it gives you a, a reading of how many calories you worth, how many steps you uh, walked. It tries to encourage you. You try to track your trends. So those of you who have Apple Watch, I know some of you who like the technology. Those of you who are interested in something that can help you to keep accountable, I suggest you know if you have a chance get an Apple Watch, Samsung Watch, whatever. Um, you know that, that technology can help. And also remember when you do start to exercise try to lift weights. You don't have to lift 50 pounds. You can start lifting five, 10 pounds. That resistance that, that you feel in your muscle, that burn, that, that tiredness, that's your body burning sugar. That's what you want to do, especially if you want to prevent diabetes or treat diabetes. So I encourage you, a lot of you guys will get aerobic exercise. Me and my father, we, we, you know, last summer we rode our bikes almost every day. That's something that we also do. We also need to strength train. You don't have to lift heavy weights, especially if you're getting older, still strength train. 10 pounds is good. Five pounds is good. Two pounds is good. Any something strength training to use your muscle and burn that sugar, that will help treat you from diabetes. If you have a lot of muscle in your body, it actually prevents you from getting diabetes because it, it, it allows the insulin to be burnt up because muscles take insulin in. Uh, I mean, it allows um, the sugar to be burnt up. And so start to strength train, start to walk outside, count your steps. Your phone already counts your steps. Your Apple, Samsung, any kind of phone that counts your number of steps. Look at your steps every day. Aim for 10,000 steps. It's a very tough number, but if you do 10,000 steps, watch. You'll start to lose weight. You'll lose 10 pounds if you do 10,000 steps within a month or two. Very simple challenge. You don't have to go to the gym. Just 10,000 steps. I bet a lot of you sit in front of the computer screen or go to work and don't move a lot. Look at your steps. Look at your phone. Ask your, ask your, your children to show you their step counts. Look at the step counts on your phone. If it's around 2,000, 1,000, you'll see how the weight gains. A lot of people during the lockdown, we're not moving. If you start to move a lot, you'll see your weight drop. If you start to get to 10,000 steps, maybe walk to work, maybe walk to the store, do those little things, you'll start to lose 10 pounds. And 10 pounds, I think for every like um, 10 pounds, you, you, you drop like a four, I mean, three, four, five points in your blood pressure that you lose. So you can start controlling your blood pressure, start getting back into shape with small steps. So I just wanted to say that because I think Professor made a great point. We, we talk about diet a lot, but we don't also talk about exercise. Okay. Uh, and then after you, not Sarah. 
Hello, David. Mm-hmm. Hello. 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 Uh, uh, thank you family. for all the information and education that you are giving to us. Mm-hmm. One thing I would like to know uh, about Johnson and Johnson, the vaccine that you talk about. Yeah. Do you encourage us to get uh, Johnson and Johnson? Or what education are you going to give us about that vaccine? Because what we have heard from news and the health experts, they are saying people who uh, people who have been taking it are getting a uh, blood clot. Yeah. So what advice are you going to give it to us? Okay. As a church. That's a great question. My advice, definitely get it if you have the, if they offer it to you. Why? It's one in a million chance. Why do we say that? Because a lot of medicine that we give you have side effects, right? If you have hypertension, the, um, the, a lot of the medicine, the, the, uh, the calcium channel blockers, that can cause swelling in your body, right? The, um, the, um, the metropolol, right? As many of you are on that, that can cause um, your heart to slow down to a certain point. It can cause other problems. Um, so medicines, a lot of them have side effects. There's, there's really no medicine that without any side effect. Even Tylenol, you take a lot of Tylenol, Tylenol can um, destroy your, 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 your liver. Aspirin and, um, and just um, ibuprofen, that can damage your kidneys. But the thing is, these things happen on a very small level. So in medicine, we talk about risk and benefits. The benefits far outweigh the risks, right? Because COVID causes blood clots at a higher rate, at a much, 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 much higher rate on the order of tens, I mean, hundreds of times to thousands of times, much higher than the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So the guidance really is, and I actually looked into a deep dive into it, that they looked at, they looked at women and they said, and maybe Sarah will comment in on more because that's you know, Sarah's expertise. Um, they looked at it and they, okay, the, the, the rates of blood clots in women are about five in 1 million. This, this vaccine, they gave it to about 6 million and about, I think, I think it was about six women that got it initially. And they were finding more cases as it developed. But initially they had six women out of a million. I mean, six million out of six million women. Six women out of six million um, people were given to had it. And so the, the risk is one in a million. So they, they, they said, pause, we're not giving the vaccine right now. So they paused it for about two weeks and they did a deep investigation. They wanted to look at the woman who got it. What were the causes? What, what, what were the risk factors? They looked, at, they, they looked at their health. They took all their files. They examined it very thoroughly. I followed it. They had meetings from the CDC that advisory committees, doctor committees came together. They all met and talked. They debated. They looked at the data. They, it, it got very contentious, right? Because these things in medicine, we actually debate. The thing about medicine is that we debate things. We see it. We have to prove the data to other people. People will verify what you say. You can't just lie. If you lie, somebody will see the data. And if you lie, you'll get in very in big trouble, right? The FDA can come down and re- arrest you. They can um, they can halt your, your company from selling drugs. There's a lot of things that they can do. And it, more so, the companies put billions of dollars into this. So there's not incentive to lie about it. Um, so what they said was they're going to continue to give the shot because the risk far away the benefits. COVID causes blood clots. I'll say that again. COVID causes blood clots. What are blood clots? Blood clots are strokes. Blood clots are your foot getting amputated. Blood clots are things in your body, you know, parts of your body getting amputated, right? Sarah can tell you about patients that she she had that had blood clots. And so the risks outweigh the benefits. The thing about this country, the nice thing is that we have enough mRNA vaccines to go around for everyone. So it's not likely that you'll get the Johnson & Johnson. I would say as a man, you shouldn't worry about this. They, they, women have a higher chance for blood clots. And so they found these cases in women. They didn't find it in men so far. And so at least to my knowledge. And so um, I would say the recommendation for women, you can consider one in a million is nothing. To me, one in a million is zero. Because if you look, if you do the number zero, 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 one, that's very low. That's basically zero, right? Because nothing is perfect, right? Your car breaks and stops working. That's one in a million chance, but you still drive your car. And so... You have to you have to think about um, the risk, right? One in a million versus the very real risk that COVID can give you blood clots, and I think it's way higher. It's like in the one in the thousands, maybe one in the hundreds that COVID can give you blood clots. So they say weigh the risk. If you're a man, get the Johnson Johnson, you'll be fine. It'll just one and done. If you're going to Ghana, it's actually probably better because it'll, it'll be save you time. Because if you get the Pfizer and the Moderna one, that's five or six weeks that you'll take to get the full effect. Pfizer, I mean the Johnson Johnson is done after 28 days, and it's just a one shot. Um, but I don't know, maybe Sarah can comment and Sarah can bring her to the next point. 
I say get it if you're a man, especially if you're a man. If you're a woman, you can talk to your doctor about it. Um, but you could still get it. I would say get it. Um, but if you're a man, definitely don't hesitate about getting it, getting it. Um, example, Ghana, they're given the AstraZeneca vaccine. AstraZeneca had the same problem, but people are not sure if it's actually linked to blood clots. And you know, people are doing well with the AstraZeneca va- vaccine. I've seen people in my family who've gone in. So you have to watch a lot of the, the stories in the media. They might not be representative of the actual risk profile. Sarah, do you want to make your point? Uh, sure. I mean, again, everything about our risk benefit ratio, it's one in a million chance for women. Um, women tend to have a little bit higher estrogen. And so there could be some component of that, which leads to them having a higher chance of getting blood clots. But even still, the risk of getting a blood clot from the COVID vaccine is much less than the risk of getting um, COVID and the risk of getting blood clots in COVID. Um, my question for you, David, and thank you for this program. Um, one of the things about what I noticed about Black men, especially Black men's health, is about Black men friendship. I think a lot of the times Black men tend to be out isolated and feel like they don't have somebody to talk to or somebody they can um, rely on and that community can really help them. So I just wanted to know, like, what do you think can be done about Black men getting friendship, getting the mental health support that they need so they don't feel isolated? Thank you. Yeah, Sarah, um, that's a great point because the thing about Black men is, you know, when you, when you become a man, you, you, your concern is your family, right? Uh, and men don't have friends right? or they have few friends or few people they can trust. So a lot of men, as we see, and this is in studies, as men get older, especially in their later 20s, early 30s, they start to lose a lot of friends um, and they don't have friends. They said their friend is their wife, right? But you actually do need a form of socialization. You can see the mental health in this country has deteriorated because people are not socially um, conversing. They're not socially talking to each other. They're not interacting with each other. We need, we are social beings, right? There's a reason why God created Eve for Adam. The, um, Adam couldn't just live on earth by himself in the garden. And so people are social, right? So, you know, maybe um, Uncle Defo, he, you know, he's a very social person, very outgoing, he sings and stuff like that. That protects his health, right? Talking about things protect your health, right? Saying, you know, having a friend that you can talk to about things helps you, right? A friend can give you good advice. A lot of men, they don't have friends and then they don't go seek advice from another man. They don't want another man to tell them what to do. So a lot of men don't go to their doctors. They don't want the doctor to tell them what to do, right? They might not say explicitly, but that's some of the mentality that goes under it. And so how do you create male friendships, right? You need to maintain your friendships because that actually protects your health. It sounds stupid, right? But we actually study how much stress affects it. One perfect protective factor against stress is having friends, right? Talking to people, socializing, um, you know, talking to people. That's what therapy is. T- therapy is basically paying somebody to be your friend and listen to you. And so um, Black men need friends. How do you go about creating a friendship? I think we have to change our mentality towards friendship is that, you know, these are people that we need. It's okay to have a friend. It's okay to confide in a friend, somebody you trust. It's okay, you know, to tell somebody your problems, somebody who's trustworthy, you know, and um, it's tough. A lot of Black men at a certain age, they don't have too many friends and they think it's good to be quiet and to be humble about your, all your problems and to take all that pain and, and carry it because you are guiding the family and leading the family. But the truth is all that you're keeping inside you is creating stress inside you and that's killing you. And we know it's killing you. The term for it is called allostatic load. That's how we measure um, stress. And that's basically um, a factor of your inflammation, right? All that stress causes inflammation. All that stress leads to cortisol, right? That's a stress um, That's a stress molecule in your body, right? It's, a, it's like a steroid that's in your body that's released. And then your body basically tells you, man, yo, I'm stressed out, I'm stressed out, I'm stressed out. And so that stress raises up your blood pressure. That causes problems in and of itself. It raises up your glucose levels. That causes problems. And so all that stress, all of you keeping everything by yourself, you having no friends, all that is leading to your worst health, right? And that leads to bad behaviors and also leads to physically you being more sick. And so it's important that you have the friendships, lifelong friendships, maintain that. The church community is essential. If you go to church, make a friend, right? We have time in church built in the lunchtime, the time that you have to talk about your friend. You can't just be on church board and you can't just be in the pews and you can't just go home. It can't be it. You have to come and talk to people. You know, we're, we're seven day events as we talk to each other about our different problems. We have similar faiths and similar beliefs. So we need to start connecting more. 
release some of that stress. Once you talk about things, that stress goes away. It takes it off your body. You don't believe me? If you ever talk to somebody about your problems, you can start sleeping. Do that. Tell somebody all your problems that you trust and then go to sleep the next night. It'll see you sleep better. So Sarah makes a good point. And I would love to do a mental health lecture. I have a lecture about sleep that I already prepared and I gave it to Bridgeport SDA. And I can give you a, a lecture about mental health. There's a lot that goes into black men's mental health. Black men have the worst mental health in this country. So that's another conversation for another time. Okay. Hello? Hello? Um, my mom is also that. Hello? Antiana, we are not Antiana. Antiana, what am I Antiana, what am I cutting? Uh huh. Eh, and some are more canning in a no credit. Now, as a sea pet, so he's here, a bit to me, a bit to me, a Nia eba wo mosu. O nia me fa ne hun ho mosu. Wo ti se kamu mu bi nya nsa mu mu se awura. O nia me fa ni nya nsa so. Eni ma me kwaj. E ka saye e bra na ade ni nya ma. Wo ti da ti. Da wo bi e kemika. A e be fa ni ma be brimu. Na se ya ju. Enti nya me ma. Wo di chako ne ma ye. So you know, so chaku, any chemicals if you ever want them be a trim, not born at working. Any chemicals if you are trim, not born at working. And what am I saying? They made that for. And so we do so. Now so we tell you so to melt, and so they come. It means I need a man to bring. Yet see, for my money. Eh, policy, you want to pump by what say, and what it can't say. One more team, but it's a woman answer, won't be giving it at me. You are more free. And see, yet the other said, Well, three yet, no more. Eh, my son said, As I say, and they will see who are what we will see me. Now, what you know, now what you are near ma. What was it, would you a breath that say thing? Ah, a bayer, a rea. Sasa matam. No, what to chat, oh, eh, eh, you be a no to chan out the six freezer. What to freezer, let you go. And there's a do brow or womua. Where's you near mamma out? No rules. Nia Kamikasa, what would they as yet near Meninano? Bow, Missano, won't you mean Yanina in Cacabe Frau near me? A fremen sua. And then say, we use you black, you know, check with me a friend black. We use you, no. Let this show and come it out of here. Now, a poor way. And see, and no necessary me me that on your mere cat in a yen. And then you also for great to you and you so many that for see any. And see, my young child, your best. Now, wait to me a dear who gain you who can't see. Na magi magi na do so we do animal no no wa twen ho sim mo me ma no so mo na mo dia trouble so no ba wo je ni yire dia me a wo di natural ne no ama ne ne yire no ade ama no enna mo se chemical se na de kene natural wa ni nti no o ku obi fie ni ko di obi abi a ni a kwati a wo ba ni de wo ni mo bia ne ni wo ne bia ne ne de wo bi puse puse mu a wo se she and there, young and I are trouble because what could be now that would be a bean and now would be a bean in what a more different friend from a monarch a colonel. What was it? Or Brandy Mudian is not turning it. Who are best on a year who would deny him. And young and I am no one. Then we are moving up for chef for ten years. You would have near you. And to move any year. No one go back to a bean yamon. When I now move to the monomoma, young men would be. Namuni, Namunia Magi Magi. Who pass as he be more with Baby and Namunia be pass as he be more dear conscious as you are naturally. What say you are yet? No good bottom. Next, she freezer. Now, who call her? Get back one bro. 
David, David, can you hear me? Yes, David. I can hear you. I just have to take myself on mute. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm very, very, we thank God for some people like you. I'm really impressed. Uh, not, not that. I don't know how to put it. I know you can do better than what you're doing. And that's, I know that. Mm -hmm. But there is something I want to bring to your consideration going mm -hmm. forward. You know, I like how you put it. We are disadvantaged by being African American in, in, in America here, by culture, the way we were raised, you know, how poor we were. So when we come here, we're trying to do what we can do. In so doing. Now, oh, yeah. just make it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's pretty David, just because you We are compelled to do it. Said you family. So it's more more be see it, you know, I say, I saw him the many two more. I'm not here more the way you are. I'm not the way you are coming. The suggestion number one is, "Mono mon kamo mona mon pebri bi maye." Because all said the whole kind, you know, we think we are macho. We are very stubborn. We are really, really stubborn. Very true. Now, a a court, you know, now yes, sir. You say you deliberate to say. You want to manage yourself to get better. It's true. Even though you know, sir, hospital, it has yeah. become part of us. It is so difficult. Who can say, David, and yes, I'm Ketua. More frequently. We respect you. We are in dilemma. I'm telling you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are in crisis. You move be per se. In this situation, you know, you don't na na Because the whole environment is bad. It's true. I just came yeah, back. We can walk around. Yeah, I'm going to go to Ghana. I'm going to go to Ghana. I'm going to go to Ghana. 
a dear Ben Namode boy, because exercise are okay, but we are we are caught in the middle, sir. And I didn't create the exercise, no, a bit more true. Oh, and yes, said deliberate to say, yeah, to one you, yes, he did go now see you. I had drama, and he moved in a moment, and said, Be you want to be a catcher, and I said. No, out there, thank you for the comments because it's very important what he said. I, I do think, you know, I just, I just went to Ghana a few weeks ago. The lifestyle in Ghana is better than the lifestyle here. That's for sure. There's less stress. Yeah, and David, to add a little to Ankla Moateno. Yeah. Mm. To add a little to Uncle Amwati, you are Ghana, no, you be BI, yeah, 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 exercise. Yeah. You are toilet, and you are a WC. It will call Koto Horn, Moa, who call toilet, or chessmen, or you are 15 minutes now, what Bunko to get. Well, you are full full, now you are one, and you are exercise. You are back for more than 90, but you are five miles in, five miles back. Oh, and now we are in so you are fine. Oh, no, and mm -hmm. from my papa, and we are in a number of you are more by your final quack. I have seen to see a question to him, and you be at the bread this year, quarter of Ghana. No, look, you think. The thing is, you know, I think people are making a joke about this, about this, but I think it's true. I think if you have the means, you should retire to Ghana. I, the thing about Ghana, about the healthcare system, is the critical care, the acute care, right? very sick, that is a little bit when you have to worry about. But I do recommend lifestyle-wise, stress-wise, the stress in this country is killing us. So, you know, for me personally, I, me and my sister were talking about this. We would love to retire in Ghana, right? Because everything's there now, right? It's, it's different. Everything is there, right? You have the best specialists in the world are there too right now, right? The, the type of surgery I want to do, people are already doing that. I already, I saw, um, you know, one of my um, friends, um, he knows a doctor that does exactly what I do already in Ghana. I saw his office too. And so, and so, you know, everything is there. The thing though, is that we, a lot of us that live in the United States, we get sick. And so by the time we go to Ghana, you need a lot of health care. And then sometimes you might not get that care at the level you need. And you see a lot of needless death in Ghana because maybe they might not have the oxygen, they might not have the um, some of the things at that. For the rich, for the rich, for the, for the people who have money, you can definitely get all that. You'll be fine. But there are certain people who don't have everything, and so I definitely think that you know Uncle Elder Martin and Elder Boafo, they're saying these things. I think it's very true. You should go retire in Ghana. I think it's the lifestyle is not good here. The racism is not good here. The stress is not good here. The food quality is not good here. So go back. The thing is, you want to go back in optimum health. Start taking care of your health. You know, we young people, are, we're going to carry this, right? Elder Martin has two sons who are already going to be um, doctors for sure, right? And you have your daughter and you have your other son, right? So you have almost four doctors. You have everything in your family, right? You're going to have a surgeon, you're going to have a physician, you're going to have everything in your family. We have connections, right? I'm actually even part of an Adventist men's physicians group for young people. You know, I'm going to tell more people about it. I think Stephen's part of the group too. So we're all, you know, Stephen started medical school. So many people in our church are doing medical school and, and, they're, and they're becoming doctors, right? So we're the next generation. Sarah's almost finished with residency. She's a full, almost a full doctor. She's virtually a full doctor. In one more year, she's gonna get paid all this money and then be a full doctor, doing surgeries, cutting people, women open, doing all that thing. Right? And Sarah wants to go back eventually to do some of that in Ghana. And so we're, the young people are doing things. I do these talks because I think my parents did them. And so it's now our turn to start doing this, getting the information to us. I do the research. So I'm studying you guys. I'm looking at the numbers. We're developing those numbers and we're doing it. My final presentation for my program is on Wednesday. And so I have the numbers. I already made the slides. I, can, I get to talk to professional scientists. And so we're doing the work. We just need to start putting that work, we're putting that work into practice. Elder Boafa made a great point. That walk-in that you did in Ghana to the farm and back, picking up with a bunch in and doing all of that, you know, that actually leads to your better health because you're being physically active. This lockdown has worsened a lot of people's health. If you look at a lot of people, a lot of people gain a lot of weight because they're sitting around all day on Zoom or they're not moving as much as they could. We have this idea called walkable cities. Cities have to be walkable. And in and, and, and Accra, you can walk everywhere, right? You can sit down, you can relax. In Kumasi, you can do the same thing. In smaller towns, you can do the same things. And so, 
the environment that we are, are lived in with the stress, you have to pay bills, you have to pay bills and pay bills. People are sick, you're taking care of all your family members at home. All this constant stress, what are your kids doing? Are they safe? All that stress is being taken out on your body. And so, you know, I, don't, I know that Elder Mott's talked about, we don't want to be, we have to be this way. It's very true, you have to. To make it to here, you have to be very resilient. So you have to be very tough to make it to the here and then provide for your family, go to school, get a job, uh, you know, you know, do night shift, doubles, doubles, doubles. That takes a lot of energy. And so it's not that people are bad. It's just that the circumstances that you're in create bad health care. And so for you, what can you do is take a little bit of actions. Try to try to relax more. Try to talk about your problems more. Try to walk more. Try to eat better. Less processed foods, right? Um, less meat, you know? Uh, the vegetarians make a point, but also uh, um, Uncle Odifo made a great point that there are vegetarians with hypertension. So don't don't let that skip you. That there are a lot of vegetarians that are not healthy, right? Because a lot of them are eating a lot of starches, and so you have to do vegetarianism the right way. You know that doesn't mean just eat plants, 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 and and eat all these carbohydrates and all the jollof. You need to eat a balanced diet. You need to get your protein. You need to um, do that. And, that. and there's plant based versions of everything, and so you you have to be you know, you, you have to be a little bit scientific about everything. And, you know, you, you can do the remedies if you want. But when your doctor says, take your medicine, take your medicine. People with hypertension, like, oh, I'm going to take a dietary approach. If you have uncontrolled hypertension and you're in your 60s, why do you think the plant-based diet is going to stop you? Because it's, it's, at that point, it's unnatural to get your body to that point. So you need unnatural interventions to get your body back to where it needs to be. So a lot of people will get prescribed medications by my parents or, you know, my sister or whatever, and they won't take it. They don't take it, they might have a stroke, they might have you know, a heart attack, they might have something bad happen. So when your doctor gives you your medicine, it's not just that they just wanna give you medicine. They don't get paid off of prescribing you things, at least medicines like that. They don't get paid off of hypertension medicine. They, they write you to know they don't get paid from that. They, they get paid from the visit. So there's no incentive for them to do it. The incentive is for you to take care of your health. So when they prescribe you the hypertension medica medication, take it every day, take it as prescribed. Very important, it could save your life. Hypertension is incredibly important. A lot of people take play with that. They say, oh, I'm just gonna eat better. That helps a little bit, but it doesn't do as good as the medicine. The medicine is research scientifically designed to bring your, your, your blood pressure down. If you don't wanna be on medicine, start taking care of yourself. If you take care of yourself really well and know your numbers, just don't take care of yourself and not go to the doctor. Eat good and then go to the doctor and see if you're doing well. How do your doctor see your numbers and say, okay, this person, he's eating right. He is exercising. We know that he's healthy. You know, they, they'll, they'll check you. You know, you, you go take your car. When you have to change your oil, you take your car to get to change the oil. You don't just keep driving your car. So take the same way with your body. Your body is a temple. Treat it like the temple. Um, for me personally, I know exercise is going to be part of my whole life. If I'm going to prevent diabetes, if I'm going to prevent hypertension, if I'm going to live past 72, it starts today. It starts for everybody. You build these behaviors, these habits. You know, you get physical exercise. You start moving around. You will live longer. That little walking around that they do in, in the farm, that's how they live to 80, to 90, to 100 in Ghana, because they're physically strong. Their bones are tougher. Their heart is stronger. Their body's more hardy. But if you're not doing that in America and taking all that stress, what are you doing it for? Why are you working yourself to that? Take care of yourself. Okay, David. Uh, Dr. Ajima, Hello. Hello, Patrick. Hello. Hello. Patrick, the program is Dr. Ajima. Hello. Dr. Ajima. Hello. Hello. Yeah, but the next program, on bet you me a baby, any ancassa so any bet you me a year pa. Now, to set exercise a year came. And your money be a while, so won't call Castle over there. Would the name of P be you who are no one to me a year? And until Yanya was a free movie, ye one and four. Eh, send me was a question to be a comrades who fred you my pet no for her. She said, Oh, no, make one soon echo. No man in the walk. You have a walk. Three to four miles every morning, and sana head to four exercise, my baby. I told the beer, send yes, sir. Oh, bam, mammy, and now my friend is my area. 
and to be obeying one or so in Nadia Mimma. Nancy and Yemi and Wakabo moving to no. Oh, new humble. O be to say, Minnie, I'm watching, baby, I would see. Pebble be as the phone on to only be. Now, also, Minnie, so so call walk, pa. If you are walk, no, for whom I will be. Nan and uncle, if you are a cry, and yan ho, and an uncle. Or you're a super cock of another damn for me. See, I can come near my kaya who bomb a ye yano ye what would be a yen at the ye as sincere becas a yen qua ye bay a so cassa won't qua bay a obey ya to a one shall own ye de biarada. Ye toss him ye know, M. said David the car point to be a fat set ye a pessy a cotton nephew, who be our cotton nephew biano. Ye are now walking home a a health care system a wogana. Because nipper pee or wa, even send your mocha say oxygen crano. A whole day will ho and many pe woo. Nan so it has a one here, who fray, nine one one cried the bebro fee. And when she said, Yen, it will be a so condos here, but quack in the fee. I then a sicker for a moe moon, penny for a moasa for you. A mom monkey come home, mom, and a mom yanky came home, mom, na yen yen could see a hospital. Ah, your crab. Amen. I think Professor made a great point. Having, you see, you kill two birds with one stone. Having a friend that you go on a walk with, right? You, you walk, you talk about everything in life. It's relaxing, right? You got to talk anyway. So why don't you just take a walk? We don't have church anymore. So instead of, you know, calling somebody, call them and, and do a walk together and walk. That three, four miles, that'll get you close to your 10,000 steps. That's about 10,000 steps, that about around four miles. And so if you if you do that, you, you get your health right, and then you get to take the stress, talk about the stress, and you get to relax and have uh, fun with your friends. And then that's how you, you know, you maintain your health. That little bit of time, that maybe the hour that you invest in every day, that's going to pay dividends. Because when you're, when you're 65 and ready to retire, or 70 and ready to retire, you have good health, and you don't have to be in the hospital all the time. Now, Professor makes a great point. Why don't we go and build the, 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 the hospital system in Ghana, right? The problem, you know, I don't. I, I want to study this more because we actually we actually do work with actually Ghanaian um, professors who actually come here to train at the NIH. Um, they actually work on some of our projects, and we need to just um, we need to start thinking about the healthcare system in Ghana. The thing about Ghana's healthcare system it's very privatized, right? If you have the money, cash, you can get any service, right? But it's becoming expensive, right? So you, if you have the cash savings, you can get you can go there and get the services you need. But there are certain points where you have very critical care that they're going to send you color boot and color boot is overwhelmed already. And so you might not get the care that you need. And so we need to start building that healthcare system, right? We have a lot of young doctors. We have a lot of money that's going to Ghana. There's a lot of investment that's going on. There's a lot of building that's going on. Once that healthcare system gets developed, it's going to, be, it's going to get better. Even in Kumasi, there was a, being a military hospital I saw being developed. That's the future, you know. Gonna, we need to start training do more doctors he, um, in Ghana to provide care. Um, that's part of the things I've been thinking about as a researcher. Like having that right, ophthalmology, eye disease, right? A lot of people can't see the night, the need, uh, the surgery. Cataracts is a very big issue in Ghana. Um, Age-related macular degeneration is a very big issue. These are things I address. I should be going back there and helping to add to that system. And so I plan to one day, and I plan to help train other doctors once I finish my training. So these are the things that you have to consider. But if you take care of your health issues, you take care of your numbers, you take care of the walking, you take care of the eating right, hopefully you don't need to interact with the healthcare system. The sad part is everybody who gets to the hospital and they're hospitalized, it's too late. That's, that's, that's when we want to get you before. We want to get you before you get hospitalized. Everything in medicine is about hospitalization. We want to prevent that. And so do your parts. Get a get a friend. Go on go go on a walk. Have somebody hold you accountable. If not a friend, get an Apple Watch. If not that, go with your wife. Go with your husband. Get active, and start eating better because we talked about it. The diet matters. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm Okay. If I show me, dear Miss Sandy said, Miss Cady, she may be by say, and that's a more kind of bro for Musana. Oh, we are Nanka, or be your teaching, so no one's well born a tough hour, Timo. Nay, and Musay, a bro for me, and Penny, and yet, and I take a crack. A cobany sabre of one quay, and Musay, and the interior is I disobey, so to Musay, and Winyan, so be say, bear ninety per cent. Mantia, oh, me can say. 
Okay, okay. 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 Ghana no enye safe zi say mi say mi ma classify me ho say me freedom fighter say say abusu yoni ti nyina wo mba di jo mba no wo ya mi a nti sentence ma da kwara no bi fira me say be a problem we na aba freedom fighter nti se si an e ma e ma me problem what i say ana ne to so bi ye he Ghana se si an Ghana na ye ja ho no ye ni Ghana na e wo ho se say se say I'm saying that by no. So we have YouTube. Yes, so now we're holding in a positioning in a politicking in a with the mercury in a safe for no money to get them say no. It is a say no. Many scientists and I mean your doctor and I mean co school new at the baby. But me who say future generation of Ghanaians, you know, or moving your cancer and other disease. Yeah, a woman you do say be a genuine. I do know, Madam Master. Okay, Dr. Jan, last. Okay, yeah, the crumb is a mechanical, Dr. Jimakaino, sir. Young could see hospital Ghana, you know, Adventist or hospitals or Ghana. But the funny thing is, sir, Michigan has a World Medical Relief Agency, their NGO. If you can pay $10,000 to them, because one more employee will have cost, in the first 6000 16000 they can supply all the equipment you need. University of Michigan, which I worked there for 21 years, medical equipment, but you suggest about two, three years, then we give it to World Medical Relief. These are good equipment can be used in Ghana. I used to ship container for the container almost every year to Ghana. And I used to have Ministry of Health procurement and supplies to pay for it. Until somebody directed for free by one Mr. Samuel Boatibi, was used. Let's, let's assume so they call Dam and Go Hospital. Dam and Go should pay for it. And some of these hospitals don't have the $16,000, you know. So I've stopped. I used to fund it, but I couldn't do it, keep on going. Now, what happened is that uh, one Dr. Boatibi, he was in charge of Adventist hospitals in Ghana. What about Columbus, Ohio? But yeah, appeared in here, and I told him this. I can help you. What about Ghana? I never heard from him. Uh, Pastor Bedia, who was one time the Secretary General for Honest uh, when he was free general conference called Ghana, you know, he was in charge of Ghana hospitals. And then I uh, told me about it, he never followed it. Three weeks ago, Andre Achina, Mr. Amu uh, Kesi, I think uh, Elder Kesi Mpahu Fas, you know, your friend, uh, he, he's not in charge of Adventist hospitals in Ghana. He came to see me in a hotel, Accra, Accra is the hotel, I was leaving Ghana. And I'm so I hope that you're going to follow you through. Because Mimi Fri and Mabu, and Mabu is now part of the Mid Central Conference. When we are busy, they don't have hospital. In the Matosa, I saw one of Mabu, three acres. Ah, we're going to build hospital, a PPP, private partnership, public, I mean, some, something like that. Ah, you can get some kind of loan to do it. They will help. The European Fund of Ghana is part of it. I don't know their vision. I said it several times, they don't follow you through. In the doctor, my hospital can be done, and we can depend on the Adventist hospitals in Ghana. I mean, to do this, Kakra met me. I can. We can equip them. There are a lot of medical equipment that here. They can ship it to Ghana. If you can pay, one of them is the uh, World Medical Relief Agency, or well, Southfield, Michigan. I'm making. I used to do that every year. They have good equipment. Whatever you ask for, they will. They won't give money to build, but if you build a hospital now, they will give the equipment, you know, for you to run the hospital. Doctor, I think that we need to discuss this seriously. Because oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, you know, you know, and we have evidence all over. Yeah. Adventist hospitals, you know. I don't know. I think this guy that you met you is yeah, a guy. Yeah, I'm yeah, yeah. Dr. Yeah. Yeah. Very, to, uh, and, uh, yeah. 2019 uh, camp meeting for the first time. And I've met him. I mean, this three weeks tomorrow, he came to my hotel in Accra because I was leaving Ghana. I hope you're going to follow it through because Dr. Boati didn't do it. But this way, didn't do but it. But I said, this guy is very dynamic. He already be here. Because I don't, okay. me, me in person, I need confidence. Uh, 
David, uh, your final words, so we move to the next uh, program, please. Yeah, um, just one I think this is, that's a great comment. Maybe we can do a program one day about building yeah. Ghana's health infrastructure. I could definitely look into it. Um, so final, uh, final words, things are changing rapidly. The whole economy will be open this summer. We need to, as a church, prepare ourselves and we, we should definitely be um, considering plans um, to open the church up and we can definitely do it safely. That takes each of us doing our part. I would say go get vaccinated. It's very safe. It will not give it to hundreds of millions of people if it was not. Um, go get vaccinated. I've been vaccinated since December. I feel fine. My sister, my father, and my mother all vaccinated. We just went back. We went to Ghana, had a big funeral, all these people coming around. We went to church, you know, and they, they mask in Ghana, but you know, they don't Everybody is, has different attitudes towards masking. We got tested, everyone came back negative. Everybody's fine. And so the vaccine works in my experience. Um, I haven't felt sick. And so I know for me, it works. Um, so definitely when you have the opportunity to take the, take, uh, take the vaccine, let's get back to church. We can't be doing Zoom forever. We pay for a church building um, for a reason. Let's put our money um, to good uses. And you know, as a black men, as black men, we create community. We all have advisors, right? The president has advisors. Um, other doctors have advisors. Everybody takes advice. So go get the advice from a professional, a health professional, a doctor, and see your numbers. And then once you get your numbers, start taking care of yourself. The small things help, and you make those small changes in your life. They add up to big things. And then you, when it's time, you can go back to Ghana. And, and, and live out the rest of your life in a very healthy way. Invest in yourself, take care of your health. It's, worth a, it's worthwhile. There's no reason why you should be dying from coronavirus at this point. Um, do your part. And that's all I have to say. Okay, David, thank you very much.